to see you all. Thank you for coming virtually and in person. It's lovely to have you all here, either in person or virtually. We have got a fantastic lineup of speakers for you today. I'm very excited about today talking about digital health and care innovation at the front line. My passion, and I'm so happy to have lots of great talks around this. We've got a very exciting debate as well. I'd, be love, I'd love to hear how people react to this from the audience, both virtually and um, in person. If you want to ask questions uh, for those who are, are watching virtually, just add them onto the YouTube stream chat and we can pick them up. Um, if you want to hashtag us, hashtag Talk Digital 2023. So welcome to Let's Talk Digital. This is the second one. We had the first one last year. It was a bit of a team's throw together, three months to do it. Me and Helen, crazy idea. It was a success somehow. And so we thought we'd do it again and make it even better. And hence we're here. And we're recording this, so hopefully everyone's happy about that. If not, hopefully you've got a sticker on your badge if you're here saying, don't film me, please, that's fine. Um, we've got Ivor and his team um, helping us with all the audiovisual. Uh, and as you will know, it's on YouTube stream and um, it's going to be recorded. So for anyone that misses it, you can watch it later. Um, now. The standard stuff. Fire exits, there's one here. There's two at the back. You go out the, for, into the main corridor and go either way. There's two assembly points in that direction, either side of the reception. I don't look too much like an air hostess doing that toy. <coughs> Toilets out that way, both sides. I don't know which one's male or female. I'll let you work it out. And what is today about? Digital innovation in health and care at the front line, showcasing what people have already built and discussing the difficult issues. Um, as I said, great lineup of speakers. You've also got posters in the, um, what I'm calling the break room, opposite in the very, very large lecture theatre opposite, where we've got posters and foods and our sponsors. Thank you very much for coming to help us get this up and running with the sponsorship. And for those online, you can see the posters. You can see the three minute videos that our poster um, or, um, authors have actually made for this as well. We've um, had a judging panel um, who have looked at our, uh, these three minute videos and we'll be doing some poster prizes later. And this is a slide I stole from last year. Um, I very much want this every time we meet in any fashion, this conference or anywhere else where we talk about the uncomfortable truths or the uncomfortable questions, the zone of uncomfortable uh, debate talking about the elephant in the room, if you haven't seen it already. And somehow we've got a global reach. So I think we're an international <coughs> conference. You can put that on your um, CPD write-up for your appraisals. There's a pay, um, person in Rio de Janeiro. I think that's the right place. Maybe it's not. But um, who joined last year and they're joining us again. We've got people in Sweden. We've got in Spain. Lots in the UK. Lots in Scotland. Well, it is UK. And I would like to just say thank you so much to our sponsors. So SWAG, Cancer Alliance Group, Gloucester University has given us this lovely lecture theatre, or well, two lecture theatres really, MD Cole, the FCI, and thank you so much to Unit One Films for helping with the audiovisual side of things. So, this morning's session, I'm your chair, Dr. Mark Bailey. Um, Co-host for the event, interim chair of the Faculty of Clinical Informatics, locum respiratory consultant and a clinician who codes, and we will be debating later, should I be coding as a clinician? I'm looking forward to it. I might have to scrub one of these lines off here, we'll see. I'll be very sad if I have to do that. Anywho, let's get started. So, straight into the thick of it. We were to have a patient representative. But, well, Helen, um, who's my co-host and medical director of SWAG and an oncologist in Bristol, will come and have a little word with everyone. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, uh, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the patient rep who was due to be here with us. Um, many of you who've been part of the Let's Talk Digital family, community, will have known Jo and the outstanding contribution she had um, as well as one of our amazing patient reps, 
She was an innovator. She was a digital ambassador and champion um, and presented at multiple meetings on digital innovation and, more importantly, what matters to patients. So, um, sadly, Jo is no longer with us. We're still very much mourning her loss, but we are absolutely determined to continue the work that Jo um, established and ensured that we focused to everything we do on the patients. And I'm delighted that Stephen and Nigel are joined us with the community, um, joining us in face to face today. Um, and so we've got a very strong patient advocacy group, um, largely shaped, I would say, by Joe's contribution. So I'm, I'm thinking of Joe today, and I ask in, in memory of Joe that when we're delivering any of the digital innovation, that we absolutely keep the patient at the centre and the heart of things that we're inclusive and digital inclusion and ensuring that we're affecting change for all. So, Jo, um, I hope I've done you justice. Thank you for your amazing contribution and we miss you dearly. Now, next up would have been Jo McDonald. He's supposed to be joining on me on the other laptop, but he hasn't joined us on Teams. So let's see if he sent me a message, but if not, I'm going to have to just bypass Joe, unfortunately. He can't be with us in person. He's on holiday in Turkey. Um, let's see if he's messaged me to say, oh, I can't get in because Teams is playing up again. Bear with me one sec. Play some music, Ivor, in the background for the live stream. <coughs> no. All right. So be it. So we're going to jump straight to Anita and Dom. Sorry, Joe. And they have their own set of slides, I think. Yeah. Jump up here and let's get that show started. Hi, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. And hopefully, Joe could join us maybe after our talk. We'll see. <laughs> Where are the slides? Oh, there they are. Already here. Amazing. Okay. Let's see if I can press the right button. Has everyone had their coffee yet? Good. I like see seeing lots of head shakes. If you haven't, um, when we get a movie, you can like nip outside and it's just outside there. Um, but we'll have a break quite um, soon anyway. So, um, our presentation is on automating admin in primary care. Um, and the reason why this is important is because uh, I'm a GP by background and often we hear, oh, there's so much admin, everyone's swapped with admin, and we're always having to make so much time for it. And so How Tech One is, um, is uh, founded by some of my friends. Um, I'm taking some time out to actually explore the digital health space and see how I can get involved to make things more efficient. I'm very much a systems um, process person. I love, love efficiency, and I just want to fix some things. So what I did is I spoke with Lydia, who's at the clinical lead um, and one of the founding clinicians, and organised some shadowing with her. I met the team and actually got really, really interested in their project. Um, and then what I did was I kind of met Dom as part of an, an, another networking event, and I heard about the skills that he had as a GP. He also does a bit of um, coding as well. I was like, you sound like you'd be a great fit for the team. So I introed him to Health Tech One and now got him a job. Um, so yeah, and that's a bit about me. Dom, you could intro, intro yourself, really. Thanks, Anita. I think you did a good job there. Yeah, got me a job, so I'm um, very grateful to you and will be for, for a long time. But, um, but yeah, so I, I'm Dom, I'm a GP as well, um, and I've always been basically a nerd, grew up with computers, did lots of programming and things, and um, I say nerd with pride, obviously, there, as I'm sure many of you do as well. Um, and I'm really looking forward to getting to know some of you all here. It's um, really nice to meet you. and. Uh, yeah, I hope we'll get some time to talk during the day. Um, but yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about Health Tech One and, and what we do. But you know, um, this isn't this isn't a pitch. This is just about the the, the work that we're doing and, and you know, hoping to meet other like-minded people working in the space of digital health and trying to make things better for. I think partly for the people who work in in health, which was one of the things that motivated me um, as a clinician. Very frustrated by the tools and the systems that we work with. Um, but also, I really appreciate you bringing the voice of the patient in, and that's, that's been really important to us as well. Um, we always think about patients really hard when we're, when we're working on kind of the, the product that we have, and, um, and I've got a slide just about that later on as well. So thank you for, for bringing the patient in right at the start of today. I think it's really important. So just 
Uh, let's go. Let's carry on. We've got lots to do in our, in our 10 minutes. So just briefly, they couldn't be here today, but this is the rest of the team at Health Tech One. They'd, all, they'd love to be here if they could, but they're beavering away up in Stratford. Um, so that, that's what they look like. Uh, if you ever see them around, go and say hi. Um, so our kind of mission, as Nisa sort of hinted at, is to give NHS staff one less task. We've all got way too many jobs to do, way too much way too many tasks in our pile. But for you, try and wake things up, start the morning. We've actually got one more task. So everyone get your phones out, quick. No, oh, it's gone, hang on, it's coming back, it's coming back. <laughs> Scan that while I load up the uh, page, if I can get this laptop to behave. Oh, Mark, everything's vanished off the screen. Apple's not playing with me. Uh, yeah, yeah, I have a Mac. <laughs> it's like a no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, it's, it's always the classic thing, isn't it? I, I do quite a lot of, um, I have to use Teams quite a lot at work to talk to practices, and it, it probably works 50% of the time, and it's kind of embarrassing. I'm like, yeah, I work in, dig you know, in digital, we're a technology company, here I am, I can't even get video conferencing to work properly. <laughs> I was up last night actually trying to ask ChatGPT how to embed Mentimeter into the presentation, <laughs> But it did not end very well, and I just kind of like rage quit. I just literally put a placeholder kind of like print screen. That's what it is right there. Uh, it's left. So, buy us some time as you guys get your phones out, but clearly it hasn't worked. Okay, are you, are you, are you mostly in? Can I have a show of, show of waves? Okay, good. I'm going to not press full screen because I have a feeling it might, um, it might like move itself onto a different monitor or something. So, we'll keep it in the, in the browser window. If everyone's okay with that. So, Fine, we're going to start with a really simple one, make sure that you're all in and that the, the system's working. So, quick choice, paperwork or robots, what do you reckon? Oh, we're <laughs> running Paperwork, in. who would rather choose to do paperwork? <laughs> the picture's cute, isn't it, though? So it is quite. I, I, I definitely I'm, not want to do paperwork. I definitely made this more difficult by having a cute You've got thingy. Paperwork. <laughs> Have I? Is that because oh. it'll keep you in the job? Is that what? <laughs> there should only be one paperwork, that's a two paperwork. Okay, I think the ratio is looking good. Liking this. Anyone having trouble getting in? Are we all happy? Nice. The technology's working. Okay. 20 votes. Let's call it there. Brilliant. Enjoyed that. Thank you very much, everyone. So, the next one. So, this is a task more closely related to the task that we're asking our busy admin staff in primary care to do. Um, think, uh, thinking about transcribing paper, uh, you know, words on paper into a computer, a job that they all do every day and they have to do it very quickly. Um, we put 10 seconds there. I've extended it slightly, actually, on the way here, because I think 10 is, is mean. Yeah, we're going to make it. We're time. making it 15 seconds. So I'm going to time it. Hold on. This is one of those bits we could have rehearsed, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK. Everyone ready? And go. So you should see... On your phone, you'll be able to see the... On your text. phones. Uh, there's uh, ins instructions to do some... Is it working? Yeah, it's working. Can, can everyone see it? Yeah. I'll give you... Instructions to sign up for Mentimeter. Ah. Uh, mine completely gone. Oh, no. Okay. Typical IT. Everyone close your eyes. <laughs> Is it... Okay, someone managed it. So some, it's worked for someone. Okay, honesty thing. Just imagine you've got 15 seconds from when it appears on your screen. Classic. Uh, we'll give it another few seconds. Okay, some good efforts. Some good efforts. It obviously ruins Wait, the line the numbers breaks. Numbers are all, all different. What's going on here? Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that works. There we go. Uh, okay, great. I mean, so there's some pretty good efforts there. I think what this illustrates. I deliberately put in lots of O's. So half of those were O's, not zeros. So um, you got that wrong to begin with. So that patient's never getting that letter. So well done. Um, <laughs> you did spell a name right. Apart, from, well, no, about half of you spelled the name right. Uh, yeah, NHS number's pretty good, but that, the last five was actually an S, so come on. Right, I think you get the point. <laughs> well, what we're trying to demonstrate is when you're under time pressure and there's like lots of things going on, imagine in the GP setting you've got the phones going off, you, you're patient facing, and someone's like just standing there kind of like getting irritated. It's, it's really hard to transcribe these things over. Um, and actually, you know, even with the online forms, clicking and pasting, the things aren't aligned, the kind of data fields aren't aligned, and there's so much room for error. Um, it just, all of this takes time, it takes brain energy, and it just, it just it's, it's exhausting, really. It takes time away from doing the stuff we actually care about, you know. So <laughs> my friends at Health Tech One, and you saw Dr. Lydia there, um, they came up with a solution. We're not trying to, you know, solve all the problems out there, but just one, um, one problem at a time and doing it well. 
Yeah, so we, we started with registration because we thought that was an area with lots of uh, routine admin and uh, it was kind of ripe for automation. Um, I presume most of you know a bit about automation, so I won't, I won't go kind of right back Has to the start. Has everyone registered with a GP? <laughs> Good yeah? question. How long did it take you to register with them and to kind of get all your kind of uh, your medical records aligned and, um, you know, get your medi medicines if you are taking any medicines? One week, two weeks, longer? Forever. 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 Yeah. yeah. So sometimes it can take a really, really long time. And actually, these guys have managed to like, shorten that time. Um, and yeah. Don will tell you a bit more about that. <laughs> Thanks, Anita. Yeah. Um, yeah, it can sometimes take a long time. It's a lot of practices still use paper forms, which is, you know, mad in this day and age. So uh, we started with new patient registrations uh, based in the GP surgery in Stratford. And my, my colleagues who've been at the company a bit longer um, developed a, a really nice web form that looks a bit like that. It starts out like that. It's got emojis. It's like friendly, which is, you know, the NHS uh, kind of communications are often very boring, very dry, and patients respond really well to things that are kind of friendly and open and welcoming. Um, and they fill in the form. That data comes to us, it's stored in a database, and then we have an RPA, a robotic process automation bot that adds its, the data into the clinical system on EMIS or system one. And it doesn't just code their kind of the name, date of birth, address. We do a lot of checking to make sure the addresses line up properly, so we reduce this whole problem they get with PCSE sending back patients who aren't registered properly because there's a comma in the wrong place. Uh, we do a lot of checking to make sure that, to match people on the spine to their NHS number. We do lots of checking with safeguarding, so we, we match patients' uh, personal parental responsibility on their record. Um, lots and lots of things to, to kind of try and improve the, both the, the speed and the efficiency, but also the data quality of, of what we're inputting into the clinical system. Um, as an example sort of case study, we did some work with Lambeth Federation, 20 of their, sorry, 30 of their 40 practices um, over a period of a few months, and, and this is just some of the sort of stats about all the things we managed to do for them. I think my favourite bits are like the, the 2,290 staff hours liberated, and that's um, an estimate based on the idea that it takes about 15 minutes to do a good patient registration with everything coded, smoking, alcohol, BMI, um, and because we can do all that instantly, um, we're, we're saving those staff a lot of time that they, they can use to do other stuff. I'm aware we're probably running out of time, so um, I'm going to crack straight on. Here's some feedback from our practices and our patients about the whole process. We take uh, feedback sort of end-to-end, -end, so we, we ask patients for feedback after they've actually been registered with the practice. Um, it takes us about six or seven hours usually from them doing the form to getting registered. We send them a nice text and let them know. Um, and then we ask them some feedback and, and we get 9.8 out of 10 patient satisfaction. And the last slide I have is kind of just more fun stats. Um, and again, the one I'm really proud of, we hit 60,000 yesterday. Um, which is pretty cool. It's about three, we're now doing about 3% of the country's uh, GP registrations a day, which is super exciting. If you are a GP or you know a GP, um, please talk to me because uh, we'd, we'd love to work together. Um, and uh, that's kind of it. Have you got anything else you'd like to add? No, thank you no, for your good. attention. I normally talk more about RPA, but I didn't want to kind of go on and on. So we'll it was call too it early in the morning <laughs> to talk about RPA and robots and um, automation. So it's like, no, 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 we're going to bore them. They're going to yeah, fall asleep exactly. <laughs> before that. So thank you so much for all your time and your attention. Appreciate Thank it. You. Uh, cool. Mark, do we know whether Joe is being Otherwise, it's going to be Q&A. Um, so, Ewan's just sorting me out. Oh, Hold on. Out yeah. Hello. Yeah. Sorted. Oh, can we, can we leave the questions to the end? Um, so, Joe has messaged on YouTube, because I was watching that, of course, <laughs> to say, uh, he's had trouble with the technology. So let's see what we can do in terms of trying to get him in front of us now, uh, in front of us now, talking to us. Joe, if you're out there watching, <laughs> you're still not joined in, which is really unfortunate. Should we put him on another device and hold it up? What we'll try and do is sneak him in later. Let's do that. Okay. So can we get... <laughs> Helen, do you want to come up just to be if there's any questions about patient representatives as well? Just to come in for the Q&A bit? Yeah? And Anita and Don, please come up. Just us. <laughs> and that one. Are you still mic'd up, Helen? Yeah. We've we got a handheld one. 
get your chap on a laptop and sort of hold him. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, so let's start with questions to the floor. Um, any, uh, sorry, um, so, um, if you want to actually ask you a question. We've got a roaming mic. Um, as well. Have we got someone that can help with the roaming mics? Oh, I'm partner as well. We can just lob them, not how many of you. Exist? The little box mics that we had before, yeah. Yeah, they've been in a sort of squishy. We're nattering. Please anyway. ask away. <laughs> Please stop me rambling. I'm not going to throw it to anybody. It's like a really interesting presentation. I just wanted to ask you about the safeguarding part. Is that done by a human or do you use like safeguarding algorithms? Because um, I know they do that in social care. Should I take this one? Um, yeah, so Dom actually had a slide on safeguarding, actually, <laughs> and it can be done manually, but he can give you the kind of intricacies of it. So uh, there's, there's sort of aspects to safeguarding around registrations, and the, the main thing is that we don't automate every single registration. We pass some over to the practice. Um, I did take I took the slide out because I didn't want to go on, but basically 80% 80, 80 is what we say. We're actually closer to 90, depending on the demographics of the area. But... Um, but often we pass over children to the practice to register if we can't match the person of parental responsibility on their EMIS. Um, and we inform the practice with these, we have this concept of signals, which are basically alerts to the practice of things that are on the record that, that we think they will want to know about. Um, and that includes things like uh, social workers, fostered <laughs> children, um, and that kind of thing. Um, and we, we generally inform them about child registrations anyway as a sort of, uh, you know, you might want to have a look at the details and make sure there's nothing there. But the, in general, the automation itself is, is uh, not monitored, so there's no human in the loop. Yeah. And the reason for that is because some of, um, some of the patients might need a new patient check, for example, and this kind of pulls them out and makes sure that we're not missing them. Um, so, yeah, there are other exceptions as well where it's manually done. Um, and that's the feedback that we get from the practices, like what is, what is it that they need? Um, and, and yeah, we take it from there. It's, it's, so um, the kind of software itself is kind of integrated and um, adapted depending on what the practice needs. Uh, thank you. Um, Joe has just, my Twitter said he can't join. He's <laughs> recording a video and he's asked Kevin to tell me, but I intercepted that message already. You've got to love tech, haven't you? Don't worry, you don't have to watch Twitter. We'll, we'll all the find time. a way around this. Um, but we have a got a question on YouTube. God, how many technologies can you mix? This feels like the, the NHS, doesn't it? Yeah. It's really a bit like that. Doesn't yeah. it? Get, use, find the work around tech to get the actual job done. This yeah. is how we work. So the question from Cyberbarn9, very internet um, profile name. Very internet name. Is with the 80 20 principle, very good principle, presumably 80% of the registrations are straightforward. That what procedures do we have that the 20% that throw up problems like addresses, names, or NHS numbers that don't match? Sorry. Oh, that's you. Yeah, I missed this. What was the question before the. <laughs> Just in the middle, I, I think I missed the. 80% of the registrations are straightforward. What procedures do you have for yeah. the 20% that throw up problems? Yeah. So, how do you handle the difficult? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and again, um, I, I should show this, but basically, what we do is we have a really nice um, practice portal, which is where they can access registration forms. It's, a, it's basically a web page. Um, the, the emails that we send them with alerts link straight to it, but they can also log in and see the queue of patients that they need to register. Um, uh, you know, and then they click on that, opens up the form with all the information we've captured. Um, in a nice kind of layout that's easy to put into EMIS. Um, and that's where they can also see documents that patients upload. So if they want to upload their vaccination status, for example, which we ask for with children, then that, that it'll be visible in there. So that's how we handle them and it basically work with the practice. Uh, we take away 80% of the kind of boring, repetitive work and leave them with the slightly more complicated bits. Interesting. Fantastic. Uh, I, I think, Helen, you had a question. Yeah. Obviously, patients come first, yeah. but we are at a time when we've got very challenged workforce. What difference has this actually made to your working lives and how you work as a GP? Happier receptionists. <laughs> you know, it's like one, I, I think a lot of our kind of workforce are very, very talented and this is a very kind of like, I mean, kind of brain dumbing kind of task. And actually they're so talented, it's all about the kind of patient face-to-face -face contact, but all these administrative tasks takes that away, takes their time away from doing that. So actually a lot of the receptionists or admin staff that we speak to or get feedback from, they're like, we love it. Um, it's great. It allows us to answer the telephones, for example. You know, we get a lot of um, feedback saying, oh, I can't get through to my GP. That's because they're doing all these like, administrative tasks in the background. <coughs> but by liberating the time, then they're able to answer that uh, phone call um, and just engage with patients a bit more, I think. Nice. Um, any more questions from the room? 
Yes, gentlemen there. <laughs> You're going to have to throw it, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get the soft mic for next year, that the little soft. cue thing. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hi, uh, I'm, I'm interested in, so you mentioned about robotic process automation. Obviously, yeah. I don't know if you want to go into loads of detail about it, but I wondered what <laughs> you, what the software does in terms of uh, guaranteeing good quality input data, because obviously you've always got this possibility with any kind of online form that you have just manual input errors. How does is there a, some kind of built-in strategies that are, that are in built into the system to kind of flag those things? Yeah, great question. Yeah, lots of validation on inputs themselves uh, so that we collect good data in the first place. Emis won't let you put in a, a single character name, for example. You, so you, you can't have that. You can't have a middle name that's an S. Because you know, apparently, the, whoever wrote Emis back in the 1902 or whatever it was decided <laughs> that nobody would ever have a single character name, so they, you can't have that. Uh, but you can have a completely random title up to 100 characters long. So, um, yeah, so lots of that input validation, but then also uh, because we take that data and, and, and store it in, in, the, in the database, all that's run by um, an, you know. Uh, Basically, the software that controls the API is able to do a lot of validation before it then feeds it back into the uh, the, the bot itself that does the, the automation. So yeah, so we do lots of lots of data validation, checking addresses against the raw mail, uh, stuff against the spine, all that sort of thing. Yeah. Any more questions from anyone in the room? Any more from YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> right at the front. Oh, there we go. Helen's oh. parting way with her mic. Hello. Hi, that's great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, what um, what communication did you have to have with Emis and System One? Did you need to get permission from them in any way? Were they helpful or? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, He's broken. stupid Ooh. question. <laughs> um, but I just I guess the RPA allows you to do it sort of permissionless. Yeah, but. Yeah. We, is there like an end user license agreement or anything? Were they helpful? That, <laughs> no, we, so we have no agreement with Emis or System One, um, and I don't think they would want to make one with us. Uh, they do have partner um, licensing agreements, obviously, but that to get access to their APIs, uh, we haven't tried to do that yet. Um, it, it, it's something we'll have to do down the line, um, but but for now we're avoiding it essentially, and and with with RPA we can basically do anything that a human can do to some extent. Yeah, you and me both. <laughs> But you know the pain. <laughs> I know the pain. We all know the pain. We all know the pain. <laughs> the idea of you must being helpful. Uh, thank That's you very it. much. Really interesting. I've uh, I've texted my practice manager to see if she's using it. Uh, wants it. Yay. Um, my question is: Have you got any plans to automate anything currently done by GPs? <laughs> yeah, really good question. What have you got in mind? Oh, lots of things. Yeah. Then they come and we, 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 want, we want ideas because like, we just want to understand your pain points and like, choose one that we can do really, really well. That's the thing, yeah, that, that's exactly right. We stuck to registrations for now because it's, it, we, we want to kind of get it right, right? Not kind of just do a, a quick solution because it's easy to automate the, the bit where you just put the patient details into EMIS. That, that genuinely is quite easy. It, it's the whole process, end to end stuff that was complicated. Mm. And, but to answer your actual question, um, at the moment, no specific plans, but obviously we, we're thinking about lots and lots of bits and the kind of low-hanging fruit of things like uh, marking normal blood tests as normal. Um, you've got to be very careful to do that correctly, obviously. Um, but that's the kind of thing that, that's quite plausible. Um, I'm imagining a world where we can do things like send people vitamin D without having to talk to them or without having to do that manually. Or, um, uh, yeah, things with normal blood tests, I think, is probably quite a good low-hanging fruit. Um, but there are lots of other things that could be done. It's more difficult clinically, I think. But if you've got any ideas, all well, well, ears. <laughs> I mean, it's really good work. Thank you. Um, do, do, do you think that um, the need for this kind of thing demonstrates market failure, really, in that every time we have to use RPA, mm. It, it, it actually is a workaround because mm. either the technology, the technical underpinnings are not there, or the original design of these things is not user-centered, either patient-centered or, or clinician-centered. Okay. <laughs> yeah, absolutely agree yeah. with you there. Yeah, completely. It's it's a, it's it's because of the terrible terrible design of the systems that we use, right? Um, you know, and the, and the failure of there to be a real market in those systems. You know, there's there's two monopolies that exist. Um, uh, yeah. I won't go on, but uh, yeah, it is, it is a failing, and we are. It is a workaround, and at some point, there's going to be a registrations API which will which will take the need for this away to some extent. Um, uh, and you might know the NHS E have got their own digital form that they're kind of working on as well, 
we don't think it's as good as ours <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, but you know, it, yeah, the, the need for this will pass, right? Um, but uh, let's see, NHS digital projects. They say two years. <laughs> Set your timers. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm going to take one more question from the floor, then I'm going to ask Helen a question. So, Great. Basil. Thank you. Um, I love the 80-20 principle. It's uh, apparently hard coded into the universe. It is. My patients as a paediatric specialist and my personal career are all sitting in your 20%. So <laughs> can you just reflect the fact you've rejected all of those? It's often the vulnerable groups, it's the niches, it's the minorities that systems don't cater for because they're more difficult. And it's not to criticise doing stuff that's easy, but the entire health information kind of ecosystem is built around what's quick and easy, what's financially important. <coughs> I guess related to Mark's point and, and to that is to what extent are your systems hard-coded? It sounds like they're fairly hard-coded. They depend on a fairly monopolistic coverage of GP systems by one company. And they also depend, in terms of hard-coding, on NHS regulations and requirements, which can change. So how easily, agilely, can you adapt without having to rewrite your entire RPA system? Thank you. Yeah, it's a really good, it's a really good question. Um, I think it's difficult to answer in the general sense, um, probably. Uh, we, you know, we. we we obviously have to adopt, adapt things quite quickly when EMIS changes stuff without you know, telling anyone. You know, so there is a bit of that anyway. Um, yeah, so that, is a, that is a really good question. I actually don't think I've got a very good answer for that. Um, I think it's probably a wait. We'll see, won't we? Um, yeah. Know, can take it back to the team. There's live streaming. We've recorded it. So yeah. maybe we can take that back to the team and feedback at some point. Yeah, I'll have a think and let's talk about It's something to think about, and this is the thing, and this is why we value the feedback from the end-to-end -end processes, right? Things that people don't think about, like, you know, as it comes up, hopefully we've caught all the important things, but if it comes up, then we kind of troubleshoot it and see how we can integrate that into the software. Yeah. We try and be, we're, we're a tech company, so, you know, the, it is, we try and be as, as quick and as agile as possible with these sorts of things, but then you, you are obviously working with the NHS, so you've got to work around the regulatory frameworks, and we've, we've done all that, DPIA and... and, and uh, whatever the other acronyms are that I should know. Yeah, but ultimately, I, um, I, I take what you're saying, you know, these vulnerable kind of patient groups, we, we do kind of prioritise patient safety and make sure yeah. that they, are, so I mentioned about the exemptions, these are the exemptions that we manually kind of process or we flag up and get the practice to review manually, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to ad adapt, and what we're going to do is I'm going to ask Helen a question and then we'll go for an early tea and coffee break. And we'll come back and watch Joe's video. Hopefully he's made the video. Um, but how quick can you make a video? <laughs> yes, well, we'll see. But, and this question I'm going to ask Helen might sound like a bit of a downer, but I think an important thing. Now, Joe, um, who was going to join, join us, Joe Chambers, um, she, she got it. And she wrote an email to me out of the blue. I think Helen put her in contact with me. And, and Joe sent me an email. And unashamedly, I actually cried reading that email. She had written down everything I was thinking, everything I was feel, feeling about digital innovation not happening and how we could make it happen better. And I, I'm really sad she's not here today to tell you and hopefully bring tears to, you, uh, to your eyes with what she has to say and what she's learned and how she thinks things could be better. And what I want to ask Helen is about patient advocates who they are and how can people get involved with them via swag or any other way? Yeah, great question. I just, before we come on to that, I'd just like to mention about digital inclusion and ensuring equity of access and addressing health inequalities, that there is no point doing all this innovation if we are leaving people behind and leaving people out. I'm not suggesting that's what you're doing. And I think that comes on to what Matimba and I were talking about earlier about bioethics and ensuring that when we're doing this innovation, how do we ensure that people are, that are seldom heard or that find our healthcare hard to reach are included in that. So I think that's a challenge to us all and I really welcome that. Um, I'm going to divert that question to um, Stephen and Nigel. You said you didn't mind me coming to you. Um, these are our patient reps. Um, they are the experts and we've got a patient forum and I'll, I'll let you just speak about it, um, Nigel or, and or Stephen, please. Right, um, okay, I'm Steve Rowley, um, and I had uh, cancer in um, 2015 and uh, went through all the surgery and, and chemotherapy. And uh, two years later, because my brother um, 
couldn't get referred because it was a very slow process to deal with the clinical uh, genetics information that there was a, a family uh, um, uh, susceptibility. Uh, he was diagnosed uh, stage four and died within six months. And there was quite a lot of system failure there and the thing, and that's got, what got me involved in, in being a patient advocate. And I work in lots of areas. Yesterday I was doing work on screening, um, uh, UCL, um, the role of junk DNA in cancer uh, at Barts, and gut microbiome and colorectal cancer recovery from treatment um, at St. Mary's in Paddington. So I get involved in a lot of different things. I have a history in this area. Um, I was one of the people who helped to invent and develop the internet back in the 1980s. Uh, so I'm really interested in what you're doing here. And I've been through massive software projects, been as a project manager, uh, product manager. Uh, so I understand what goes on there. Um, there are some interesting things from my point of view. I've, I've attended quite a lot of um, training on medical, digital in innovation in medical, um, uh, in health in general. And from our point of view, for, um, I run a large uh, bowel cancer support group. The biggest area comes in self-advocacy. So this is not people like me <laughs> who, who work in, in forums like this, but the, the patient who needs to find out his diagnosis and often doesn't get a letter until months later, or, or and, and in that case, quite often the situation is that what they really need to know is their biomarkers in order to go and get a second opinion from a specialist in treating those biomarkers. And every week counts in those things. So, so that's a big thing. And uh, my, you know, my question to you about that would be, you know, what, I, I presume at your level, you're not really talking about integration into the patient-facing apps, like um, the NHS app and MyGP and, mm -hmm. and all those things. Um, uh, so that, that, that's one area that patients you know, really need uh, to be able to get that access to that kind of thing. And, uh, and for me, I was just checking on mine, <laughs> Where, where's mine? Because I'm on like half a dozen of these apps because I try it out for all of the people. And some of them I get really good connection of, of, of information and other ones I just don't, just, yeah. It's, you can't work out why you can't, you can't see your, your, your data. Yeah. You know, it's your data. Yeah. You know, every, every patient's got that data. Um, and so, um, there are lots of reasons why you need to, to have access to this data to be able to move things forward. A big, um, mental health is a big issue for people with cancer and one of the biggest ones is scanxiety. Scanxiety is that surveillance scan that you've had once you've been told you're all clear but you've got surveillance scans and it might come up three months, six months a year mm. and uh, they have the scan and then they're waiting for the results. Mm. And if they're on a three month scan and they don't get the results till two weeks before the next scan, you've got you know, two and a half months of climbing up the walls kind of anxiety for a lot of people. Mm. And so access to that information is absolutely crucial. And people expect it now, mm. you know. Totally. Thank you, yeah, totally agree. Yeah, I have a slightly different background to Stephen. I've had prostate cancer for, uh, since 2010, still on treatment. I'd uh, and I'm also a director of Health Watch Gloucestershire. And one of the things we published in the, a couple of weeks ago was an uh, item on digital inclusion stroke exclusion. And what it basically showed was 80-20. Well, actually, it might have been 85-15. But one of the things, I, I'd just like to pick one example of where I feel the NHS gets it wrong. Um, sending out letters for appointments. We've all heard this one a thousand times. We know that some people can't get emails. We know that most people do. We know that some people can't get texts, but most people do. Any commercial organisation says, how do you want to be communicated with? Yeah. That empowers the patient. Yeah. We don't want the NHS to fix the system and tell us what we're going to get. We yeah. want to be asked 
and put it in on that basis. It would save money and it would make the patient feel part of it. And I'd also just follow up on Stephen's point. I, I have, I'm on, um, actually it's two monthly uh, tests, tests, and each two months you go through this malarkey of having, in my case, a blood test. Um, and the way you get the result is the oncologist rings you up. Now, I think to myself, I don't need an oncologist to ring me up. I just need to know what the number is. Yeah. And then a text would be absolutely fine if the answer is zero, which is what I want. Yeah. And if it isn't zero, I do want him, to, him or her to ring up. So why do we go through this charade of them ringing me up? Because they do it by phone, which is at least a, a step forward from me having to rock up to the hospital and wait half an hour while the queue's gone through. So I can get my GP results online can't get my hospital results online. In fact, my GP can't get my hospital results. So there's just so many stories. Yeah. And I'll just add one more story from a patient point of view. My wife wants to get her GP results online, but she's not been able to get the access. She has to prove her identity, which involves turning up with your passport at the GP. Mm. Now, come on, she's been, a, she's been a patient there for 10 years. <laughs> What's this about? And it's just proved too difficult for what with COVID and all that yeah. nonsense. Um, so there's, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't cost money that just needs common sense. Mm -hmm. And I like to think <coughs> patient reps have common sense, but I would also wish that the industry, which is how I see it, mm -hmm. would show a bit of common sense too. Thank you so much yeah. for that. And I think that's almost a debate question for next year. Why do we do the things the way we do them in the NHS? Why aren't we trying to do things differently? Yeah. There's no simple answer for that. Yeah. I'm all about innovation and changing, but there's barriers and we can spend hours talking about them. Cultural is one of the big ones, organisational. <laughs> I don't know if it's really the tech, but there's definitely barriers and it's a big problem that we have to fix. Anyway, thank you very much for that. Yeah, thank all you. Uh, our speakers. <laughs> thank you. And our, and our uh, patient representatives. We're going to take uh, an early uh, coffee break. If I can get everyone back for 10 to 11, and then we can hopefully have Joe's video if I can find it, and we can show that. And then Helen Winter will chair the next session and take us away. So thank you very much, everyone. I'm really pleased to be here with Stephen Rowley and Nigel Burton from our SWAG uh, Cancer Alliance Patient Advocate Group. Um, your thoughts, Stephen, on that last session? Well, it was, um, it was quite interesting to see how things are, uh, are working out in GP areas. You know, I'm really interested in, uh, in how patients can get information. So, you know, just making sure the right information is in there is a very good, good thing from the start. Uh, so I was quite pleased to see that they're they're developing that further, yeah. yeah. And, and Nigel, what about your thoughts on, on that and, you know, your questions certainly, uh, I could sense a degree of frustration with things in, in the status quo. Well, I, I've, having had much experience of uh, IT and the NHS in various forms, it just seems so much work needs to be done and really wherever you look there are opportunities and it's, this is a good one because it looks cheap and easy and a, a quick win for saving receptionist time. I'm, I'm not sure receptionist time is the top of the list, but if, it, if it's a quick win that somebody's found a solution to, good luck to them. And, and you both mentioned the, the sort of worry and, and anxiety about waiting for results and how you might prefer to receive those results. I wonder, Stephen, could you say a bit more about that? Well, you know, this can cause great anxiety for people who uh, have cancer and they're wanting to know whether their their mets have increased or come back or, or whatever and at the current systems are uh, where they get um, they have the scan and then they have to wait for a letter well you know the results of the scan go or the, the scan itself goes to a technician or a consultant to interpret which then go back to the original person who commissioned it who then has to you know, probably dictate his his response to that, which then goes to his PA, which then goes off typing, and then eventually the postal system. It can take two and a half months to get that result. So, so lots of steps and delays getting to where it really needs to be the the patient. And Nigel, what about you? Yeah, I have personal experience of that. I have I had a 
a renogram actually, nothing to do with cancer, and it turned out that my consultant was going on holiday for six weeks. Well, not on holiday, he had some, some treatment that he needed. So it would just sit in his in tray, and you think to yourself, well, surely there's a way of getting it messaged to me as well as whoever else needs to see it. And the system just isn't set up to do that, and yet it would be easy to do that. It's an email. And and you also mentioned a really interesting point about how people want to receive that information because getting getting access through an app might not be for everybody. Can you just say a bit more about that? Uh, Absolutely, because everyone knows patients are different and many of them have got digital exclusions. It could be they can't afford to have broadband whatever. It could be they're not computer literate. I have a good friend who never uses email. Um, There's there's many reasons, although maybe they have a carer. Um, and they themselves can't have it. So you can't have one solution fits all. The NHS is very frequently trying to meet everybody's need with the system. And this morning, one of the GPs said, but it won't help me because I deal with the exceptions. Well, actually, I didn't agree with them at all. I don't think you design a system that tries to meet everybody's requirement because that's a straitjacket. You need a system that, that allows the patients to influence how, the, how they get the results or how they're treated and there needs to be a consultation and if that guy wishes to work with people who, um, who are uh, uh, not, uh, not typical, good credit to him, but don't expect the mainstream IT to necessarily cater to him. I would also pick up one other point which I didn't make this morning, which is the dead hand of NHS England. Um, it was mentioned by uh, the, the guys making their presentation and that is another feature that a lot of these things are directed from the center there isn't a a grow it in the regions and let people take things forward there's a we in london usually it's london but that's irrelevant the we in nhs england know best and it's kind of hard to know best Um, much better for there be 10 solutions and the one that's best people will eventually pick up on I don't like central direction, as you may know. <laughs> I'm getting that feeling, Nigel. <laughs> and, and that's why I want to thank you both for all the work that you're doing with the Swag Cancer Alliance and for being here today. And we may catch up later to hear about the rest of the programme and your thoughts. Thanks so much that's for being brilliant. here. Yes. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I've got Mr. Basil Beckdash with me, um, paediatric surgeon, who's travelled from Leeds and, and Sheffield. Why did you come all this way? I mean, we're delighted to have you, but um, thanks for joining us in person. Thank you. Um, so I really come because these events are really useful to discuss issues that like-minded people are talking about. And the nice thing about health and digital is it's quite um, collaborative and multidisciplinary. Um, and that's the present elsewhere, but it's really prevalent in digital. And so it's really refreshing to talk to other people who think the same things, have the same challenges. And um, that's partly why I've come. But, I mean, that, that's fantastic. And it feels very collaborative. It feels a real community of kind of learning yeah. together. Um, tell me a bit about your experience of digital in, in your practice with, with paediatrics. So um, I do my clinical work in Leeds, but my digital role actually is at Sheffield Children's, and they'll not forgive me for not mentioning the team. So we have a sort of fairly large digital team that's working on a lot of implementations. Um, and it's, it's really difficult because it's a specialist provider that just does children. We do community, we do transport, we do acute care. And most of the digital products that are developed aren't developed with children in mind or other sort of minority or niche groups or areas of practice. And so the challenge often is that you buy something off the shelf or you commission something kind of bespoke and it often doesn't fit your needs. So you end up having to do lots of workarounds more than anybody else generally has to. Um, and often build things from the ground up or do things for the first time. So we're doing digital prescribing and you know there isn't a readily available drug database to plug into any product. You have to write your own. So our pharmacist has gone through over 5,000 drugs to get them fit for use in, in the sort of basic format for our development. And that's been really hard work, really valuable, and meant we can successfully go ahead. But it's the sort of thing you'd like to have something basic there for everybody to use. And, and so those are kind of quite big challenges. Because presumably that's going to be the same challenge across paediatric departments ac- across the UK. M- mostly, and you'll get the same product that's already elsewhere, but the, the one place it's not being used in another trust is the children's ward, because it's a small part of a bigger organisation. And I think that sort of pattern is reflected in the wider NHS. We, we, sort of, we talk about wanting to look after children, we use them as the sort of figureheads for charitable giving and um, service development, and, and no one would argue about spending almost more than their due because they're children. 
but in practice, because they're not mainstream and you have some special considerations, the design philosophy is more around catering to the majority, which was hence my question about the 80-20 principle and designing for the majority rather than a minority. And myself and some of my team members, my CCIO, Caroline Carrison, we're all sort of in a line of thinking that says essentially you should probably design for the niche but generalizable minority rather than for the majority and try to then extrapolate back to children. There's a common adage that children are not little adults, but we certainly think adults are big children and that clinically works and I think it digitally would work if we could do that and at a policy level that's just not the message that is heard I think centrally. And I I mean I really liked your question, It, it did sort of bring it back to the reason why we're here Mm -hmm. and um, I think there are a lot of assumptions that we make particularly those of us who are in adult Mm -hmm. care Um, and so I really you know thank you for that where do you see your next steps for improving that paediatric care and how we can really use automation or digital health tech to improve the 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 health of our future you know our future adults so I'm glad you said that I mean they are the future of health care I think the things that essentially I've become more a campaign developer I would love to do my clinical work, be an expert in my field, deal with data and that side of the business. But I'm frustrated by what's offered in terms of platforms and technology to do that. So actually, the change needs to happen in terms of policy and strategy, and that's a global issue that will actually help everybody. So I'd say a couple of things. I think we should genuinely question established standards, and I think we should genuinely look at some of the paradigms and maybe flip some of them around. Decide exactly what it is we're trying to record in a system, what our priorities for the outputs really are, and and I think the outputs that we're building for are not necessarily what I would consider the primary output, which I think is the individual care of a single person. And I think we should build systems for that and extrapolate up to public health, to academic work, to operational delivery. The the paradigm is generally backwards. And then the second thing about children specifically is we have a much longer time horizon in terms of what the needs for our systems are. When I look after a newborn baby or operate on them the first week or day of life, some of the operations and conditions my specialty looks after will impact somebody for the rest of their 60, 80 or longer lifespan. And the majority of systems aren't designed with that in mind. We, we talk about credit to care in the NHS, but the systems are generally designed as services that probably have a five to 10 year horizon at best. Um, and that reflects the nature of adult medicine and generally older populations that are looked after. And that's not to exclude them, because I wouldn't want to have everyone come and look after children specifically, but actually if we treated those older people, those adults, in the same way we treat our children, in a much more perhaps artisanal fashion, bespoke lower volumes, and built our systems for that, you could then automate it and standardise some things that are actually very common across medicine and across the age range. So build a longitudinal from birth to grave system rather than say we've done it and haven't really because we're prioritising systems and organisations rather than individuals. I am so glad you took that journey today. Yeah. Um, I think you, you've made me think, you've made me take a step back, and I think many people in the room reflect that. And we talk about the NHS from cradle to grave, yeah. so let's build digitally from that. I would love from to, that. I, I've talked across sectors, I've talked to charities, I've talked to academic groups, I've talked to clinicians, I've been at a conference this week from a, a tertiary um, private provider. And when you ask people, would you like to do this? The answer is invariably yes, but. And the but is always, but I have to comply with this standard, that policy, or this particular NHS requirement. And um, while we don't have to get rid of all of the existing infrastructure, we maybe need a new foundation, and we need to at least talk about it. Mark's mentioned the zone of uncomfortable discourse. Um, It's stifled, and many people working in health tech in all professions would like to talk about some of the existing kind of standards that we think can't be changed, but maybe could be changed for general benefit. I am um, absolutely fascinated. Um, thank you so much. And I think this should go forward as one of the talks for our Let's Talk Digital program. Yeah. I'd be really, really um, pleased to come back and talk about it because it's. Um, I think it's time to do it before we bake in some more legacy, basically. And if we can avoid more legacy, that would be really great. Really great talking to you. Thank, thank you. Transforming healthcare with AI, opportunities, and challenges. The rapid commercialization and expansion of large language models since the release of ChatGPT has led to growing interests in the function and power of artificial intelligence. This poster leverages ChatGPT to suggest some areas of interest in future of medicine and some areas of concern in a UK context. Two separate prompts were used to make the question more specific to optimize the results by the large language model. The results were compared to systematic reviews in the discussion of AI in healthcare including general medical AI. Two other prompts were used to create the title. 
The aim of this was to experiment with current tools to explore how we can leverage AI in the work that we do. The result of the comparison is described in the poster. We found similarities in the suggestions done by ChatGPT and in some of the products that were suggested or discussed in the papers namely in the field of radiology. The studies suggested similar weaknesses in the AI programs, naming concerns with privacy issues and the ethical concerns of biases. To complete this poster and video presentation, AI tools such as ChatGPT and Fleeky were used to generate ideas and create content. We can see the use of these tools to help us improve the quality of our outputs, saving us a considerable amount of time and skills. In conclusion, I believe AI tools will help to make our lives easier and more efficient and expanding our repertoire. It would be interesting to see how AI tools continue to develop. I'm joined by Dr. Amelia Randall, who um, is a leader, leader at the Swag Cancer Alliance, but also a GP. Amelia, great to see you here. That last session really got to the heart of, of, of primary care. What, what are your thoughts on that? I thought it was a really interesting session. Uh, you know, the idea of automating processes in primary care, there's so much opportunity, there's so many things that I do that I think could be much better done by a robot. So I would really love to see more innovation of this type. Yeah, I thought they really presented well. Um, there was a question from the audience about sort of inclusion and exclusion. I, I wonder what your thoughts are that, because I know health inequalities are, are, are obviously very important to you. Well, I think incredibly important, and I don't think we've really cracked the question of how we balance innovation with an inclusive approach. So there's lots of answers that we're struggling with, lots of questions that we're struggling with. Um, and for me, we shouldn't not do something because we haven't answered the question of how we're going to make it inclusive. Let's do it. Let's work with the innovation and always at the back of my mind be thinking you know is this inclusive what can we do more to engage people but sometimes you've got to set the pathway up first and then uh, you know and at the same time bring people along with you and keep that health inequalities lens through that that spirit of innovation um I, I got a sense from your question there's lots of things that you think i'd quite like to have a go at automating that i, I wonder if you've got a couple of ideas that you would share with us well, you know, and as they answered in the session, you, you, you know, thinking about automating something that a doctor does is a bit nervous making because you've got to ask the question, what do I, what do I as a human being, GP, what value do I add? You know, if what I have just done was if I was replaced by a robot, would the patient notice? You know, and that's the question. What, what things do I do that the patient wouldn't be able to tell if they'd been done by a robot? And there is all sorts of things um, like, uh, you know, this is off the top of my head, but, you know, uh, doing a prescription, um, a repeat prescription, I check their blood results and I check to see whether they've had any recent consultations. And if, if that, you know, and if, there's, if those are the case, then I'd want to read the consultations. But if somebody's had their recent blood results and hasn't consulted in the last year, you know, and, you know, you'd need to think it through because there might be things I haven't thought of in this moment. But those sort of very sort of routine things, I could see really easily being. Yeah. Of, of course. And I thought that example that Dom gave of no, looking for normal results rather than the abnormal results, which maybe do require a, a specialist, were, were really interesting. Um, I mean, earlier in the year, you made that amazing video on Ray's story um, and, the, and the work that was needed. I wondered how that is changing your uh, sort of vision of what we might offer for patients in the future and where digital may or may not fit into that. Well, so I went to an um, a art um, a show in London in the last summer, which um, introduced to me to the concept of artificial intelligence and um, the robot compassionate, a compassionate, um, compassion from robots. And I thought, you know, previously that was my answer to that question. You know, the thing that we have as humans is that we have compassion, but now there's this concept that robots can also be compassionate. And so it really forces us to think about how do people feel seen? How do they feel listened to? What is it um, that makes them feel that way? What is it that makes them trust us? And having consistency and reliability of certain things will help build the trust. And then if, if the patients trust us more as a sort of united unit of robot and doctor, then that will lead to better care.
Yeah, and I, and I think you're absolutely right on thinking how we introduce those things and ensuring that we maintain that trust. But I think it's true to say we're not really happy with the status quo. No, I think there's, you know, as they said in the panel, you know, you just can't believe how little we're doing, you know. Um, you know, if we use the technology that exists, we would already be massively further ahead than we are now. Well, thanks so much for joining me, Amelia. I want to reassure that, you, that I know that you add value to your patients, <laughs> but what we'd like to do is see you doing more of that face-to-face -face and less of the, the routine tasks that, that we argue that, that could be done elsewhere. So thanks so much, and, and I may catch up with you later to see what else you found interesting today. Yep, thanks, Helen. See you later.